Hello everyone and welcome back in Cardio Minds channel after this long gap and we are starting the AC guidelines of heart failure 2021 and today our first video is define and classify heart failure we all know the definition of heart failure from previous guidelines that it is not a single pathological diagnosis but a clinical syndrome consisting of cardinal symptoms plus minus signs due to structural and or functional abnormality of the heart resulting in elevated intracardiac pressure and or inadequate cardiac output that sometimes we call backward failure and forward failure respectively and this abnormality may occur at rest and or during exercise. We all know the famous classification of heart failure into three subtypes according to the ejection fraction and we need to emphasize that signs may not be present in the early stages of heart failure especially in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and those who are optimally treated that's why symptoms are the cornerstone for diagnosis. The most common type is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in which it is less than or equal 40% and we have heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction in which it is from 41 to 49. The previous name was mid-range ejection fraction but now MR is standing for mildly reduced and of course the famous heart failure is preserved ejection fraction in which it is more than or equal 50% but we need here to look for objective evidence of structural or functional abnormalities that are consistent with diastolic dysfunction and raised LV filling pressure so not just the presence of symptoms and ejection more than 50% is enough to diagnose HFF. We have another way to classify heart failure into chronic versus acute heart failure regarding onset and clinical presentation. Chronic heart failure describes those who had an established diagnosis of heart failure and may have a gradual onset of symptoms and if it deteriorates either suddenly or slowly the episode is described as decompensated heart failure and this may result in hospitalization or treatment with diuretic therapy in the outpatient setting. Whereas acute heart failure refers to rapid or gradual onset of symptoms and or signs of heart failure, but they are severe enough for the patient in order to seek medical advice resulting in unplanned hospitalization or ER visits, like for example acute palmary edema or cardiogenic shock. And acute heart failure may be an acute decompensation of chronic heart failure, which is a more frequent form, or it may be the first presentation of heart failure as new onset or de nouveau heart failure, which is characterized by higher in hospital mortality than the first example, but lower post discharge mortality and re hospitalization rates. And we need to remind ourselves that patients with non cardiovascular diseases may have symptoms and signs similar to heart failure but in absence of cardiac dysfunction by echocardiography they don't fulfill the criteria for heart failure however these comorbidities may coexist with heart failure and exacerbate the symptoms and signs if we move to the instance of heart failure it is a fact that the age adjusted incidence is falling due to better management of cardiovascular diseases in the last decades but due to aging the overall incidence is increasing and the prevalence increases with age from one percent for those less than 55 years to more than 10 percent in those more than 70 years if we divide the heart failure in the inpatient setting, so 50% would have reduced ejection fraction and the other 50 would have preserved ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction. While in the outpatient setting, 60% would have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 24 would have mildly reduced and 16 would have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So still heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is the most common subtype. This table covering the etiologies of heart failure is present in the full text of the guidelines. You can check it. It shows different causes of heart failure in different countries. But of course, the most common causes in developed countries is the coronary artery disease and hypertension. And regarding ischemic etiology, we need to mention that heart failure with mildly reduced and reduced ejection fraction show a higher frequency 
of underlying coronary artery disease compared to those with preserved ejection fraction. Near classification is the commonest way to grade the symptoms of heart failure from class 1 up to class 4. However, it relies only on symptoms, and there are better prognostic indicators in heart failures that does not depend only on the symptoms of the patient. So, for example, patients with mild symptoms may still have a high risk of hospitalization and death. And that's why NEHA classification, of course, is an important tool for symptomatic assessment and assessing improvements, but it should not be used solely for prognostic assessment. Now we are moving to the natural history and prognosis of heart failure, which is the longest part of our video today. Needless to say that it improved dramatically since the publication of the first treatment trials a few decades ago. However, we need to mention that it's still poor and the quality of life is markedly reduced in heart failure patients. Moreover, the improvement in prognosis has been confined to those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as here the prognostic improvement is linked to the increase in ejection fraction, and the mortality rates are still higher in observational studies than in clinical trials. Let's give some examples. In the Olmsted County cohort, the one-year and five-year mortality rates after diagnosis were 20% and 53% respectively between 2000 and 2010. Of course, that's a high percentage for mortality rates. And in a study combining the Framingham Heart Study and Cardiovascular Health Study, it reported 67% five-year mortality following diagnosis we are still speaking about high mortality rates for heart failure if we ask the classical question which have better prognosis reduced ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction of course the prognosis is better for the mildly reduced if we compared it with the reduced ejection fraction and patients who progress from mildly reduced to the reduced category have a worse prognosis than those who remain stable or improve to a higher ejection fraction category. So the answer that is of course the mildly reduced has a better prognosis. If we compare the reduced ejection fraction with the preserved ejection fraction, it may be still complicated, as the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction shows better survival than the reduced ejection fraction, but most observational studies show that this difference is not significant. In contrast to these facts, the large magic meta-analysis concluded that the adjusted mortality risk for HFPF patients was lower than patients with reduced ejection fraction. So maybe HFPF has a better prognosis, but it's still warranting much more evidence. The average rate of hospitalization for heart failure patient is nearly once every year, and from 2000 to 2010, the mean rate of hospitalization in the almost county cohort was about 1.3 per person per year, and an interesting fact that the majority of hospitalization in heart failure patients were related to non-cardiovascular causes that may be the reason for decompensation. The risk of hospitalization is higher in females due to higher incidence of comorbidities. In diabetics, it is still increasing with the higher hemoglobin A1c level in patients with AF, patients with higher body mass index, and patients with lower estimated GFR. And an important note that the absolute number of hospitalization is expected to increase considerably in the future due to population growth, aging, and increasing prevalence of comorbidities. And hospitalization, of course, is a crucial element in dealing with heart failure because it affects the quality of life of the patient and represents an economic burden in health system in any country. And the last topic to cover in our video today is the RV dysfunction. Still, the mean etiology of chronic RV failure is LV dysfunction induced pulmonary hypertension. So it is secondary RV dysfunction. But other causes of primary RV dysfunction are still existing, like acute MI, arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy, and valvular disease like primary tricuspid regurgitation or congenital pulmonary stenosis. And in order to diagnose RV dysfunction, we need to have a quantitative assessment of global RV function, like fractional area change, the famous tricuspid annular plate systolic excursion called TAPSI, and the S' velocity 
of the trichas with annulus using tissue Doppler imaging. So our take home message today at the end of this introduction that heart failure is still one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide and so deserving crucial clinical attention and we all mentioned that reduced ejection fraction is not an essential prerequisite to diagnose heart failure we have three subtypes as we mentioned and so the symptoms and signs being clinical syndrome is much more important thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week as we are going in depth with the heart failure guidelines